I'm Kyle Perry. I'm an associate professor of surgery at, o at Ohio State University, and I'm here today to interview Dr. John Hunter for the SAGES Trailblazers and Forebest Surgery Project. Dr. Hunter is a professor of surgery at Oregon Health and Science University and CEO of the OHSU Health System. He's also served as a mentor to many surgeons, including me, and it's a pleasure to be here to talk with Dr. Hunter today. Well, Kyle, it's indeed an honor. In Portland, we've shortened trailblazers to just the blazers, <laughs> and, and, and we will be a force in the playoffs this year, I hope. <laughs> Sounds right, good. Anyway. The first Please. thing I wanted to um, ask you about was, um, early in your career, in your training and early on, did you always see yourself becoming a foregut surgeon, or is that something that evolved over time, and who were the mentors who really influenced your own career? Well, thanks, Kyle. No, I, I trained as a GI surgeon. Uh, the, my mentors uh, during my re uh, residency at the University of Utah were John Dixon, uh, who was really a founder of SAGES and uh, one of the first to see the endoscope as the way forward doing surgery. My other mentor there was Frank Moody. Uh, Frank Moody was a prominent uh, GI surgeon uh, with interest in the pancreas and, gall and biliary system. So actually I started off as a biliary surgeon, but my interest in endoscopy uh, led me to be doing a lot of upper GI endoscopies, uh, at which point I detected a, a ton of reflux and no real good way to treat it. At that time in history, we were only allowed to use PPIs for no more than six weeks at a time. And so when patients came off PPIs, they would uh, be incredibly symptomatic and say, what else can you offer me, doc? And this was really what got us, got me interested in esophageal disease. Great. I, I also wanted to ask sort of early on as the laparoscopic techniques were starting to come into use in foregut surgery and other places, would, did you see that and feel that as a natural progression of open surgery as has been developed or a major paradigm shift that was really changing the entire way we were doing surgery or both? I yeah, yeah. I think you know some of the rules of open surgery applied um, in in the sort of concepts of the operation, the structures you could not injure, uh, the the uh, you know goals of therapy, but because you uh, were dependent entirely on visual optics uh, and had no tactile sense, did not have the use of your fingers, every operation had to be made different. Yeah. And if you were thinking at that time as the laparoscopic procedures were emerging and evolving. Did you envision laparoscopy and minimal invasive surgery evolving to what it is today or the way it is, or would you have seen that maybe differently at the time? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think that I saw that laparoscopy would be of use for the straightforward, simple operations, and let's put laparoscopic appendectomy, laparoscopic hernia repair, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and even fundoplication uh, there, maybe repair of large hiatal hernias, and we did those very early. I don't think I ever would have anticipated uh, laparoscopic Whipple, laparoscopic esophagectomy, uh, and some of the more major procedures that are done today. Sure, and um, as, we, as that evolution has occurred, is there anything about it that seems kind of the most surprising or the, what, that has happened already that you just could be or really didn't see coming in terms of some of the evolution of flexible endoscopy. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you know the flexible endoscope was really how we started. And again, my training after I left my residency at the University of Utah was to go to Mass General to do a flexible endoscopy uh, fellowship. Um, and uh, so we always thought that natural orifices provided the best access because no incisions were made. Um, and so to the extent that we could do uh, more so invasive procedures with a flexible endoscope, such as a poem, uh, very much in line with doing the PEG, which was, of course, an endoscopic procedure several decades earlier. Um, uh, um, so th that, I think, was kind of very consistent with the way I think saw things developing. I think the thing that actually surprised me the most was the development and the penetration of the market by robotics. That, that I really... Uh, uh, had a firm sense that while the robotic uh, platform was very, if you will, intuitive and easy for surgeons who did not know laparoscopy to learn, uh, that we couldn't prove any evidence-based benefit to it uh, would not allow it to thrive. That, that the cost 
would be uh, prohibitive given the lack of evidence of, of, of benefit. Now, you know, in, in many respects, uh, you know, had prostatectomy not come along, robotic surgery might not be where it is today. And clearly, it's easier and better uh, to do a robotic prostatectomy. But many of the other applications that are being used for uh, it just it's it, it's still the evidence still isn't there, and it's a little hard to 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 predict why that happened or where it's going. My concern is, and I, my plea is that surgeons still learn laparoscopic techniques because the laparoscopic techniques are um, translatable to almost any environment. You do not need a robot to do them. Uh, they're less expensive and they're faster. Um, and the, while there is some training requirement to do it, you know, so is there training requirement to learn how to play the piano, but one needs to do that. Sure. As, as we've sort of been talking about, just the major evolution has been in the complexity and the way in which we apply some of these the minimally invasive techniques in laparoscopy. If you look back at sort of the treatment of foregut disease and, and esophageal disease, are there any things that we used to do that were the standard of care previously that are particularly cringeworthy or bothersome that maybe we used to do it that way? Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I, I think that the, the evolution of uh, laparoscopic surgery of the esophagus has been very straightforward. I mean, it's, you know, the simplest operation perhaps was the fundoplication that then moved on to the myotomy, which then moved on to the diverticulectomy, which then moved on to smooth muscle re uh, tumor resection, which then moved on to esophagectomy through transhiatal, then ultimately two-field and ultimately three-field techniques. So that's all, you know, I think very straightforward. I don't know that there's anything really cringeworthy. I, I do, of course, have concerns about the uh, durability of some of the endoscopic procedures, some of which we've written about um, and, and have been PI on studies that have shown the benefit, but we just don't know about the longevity of those. I do have some concerns about placing a foreign body around the esophagus and what will happen over the course of you know, three and four and five bed decades. Uh, uh, after the fact, um, we certainly know that some of them are coming out. Some of them seem, still seem to work. That's uh, I don't think it's cringeworthy, but it's, it, it is uh, something that I worry about. And I think that the the last thing I'd say is that the fund application done well, either a partial or a total fund application, uh, provide excellent reflux control, uh, have great durability with a failure rate of about one percent a year, uh, can be redone if they fail. And so I'm not sure what we're trying to fix here. Sure. Do you think, I mean, I guess I would wonder or ask you that maybe the, along with maybe some of the side effects, which is a debatable point, I think, about fund application and how severe they are when it's done properly, that maybe the biggest Achilles heel is the durability issue, even with the failure rate being what it is, with a fairly high rate of people going back on PPIs young people having the operation. Do you think, are there things that have been done or can be done to try to improve the durability of the operation that we have rather than yeah, always looking yeah. at new? I, I think that the, probably the most important thing um, in someone who's on PPI is to ask whether they're responsive to the PPI. Um, and if they're not responsive to the PPI, and as we've shown in the New England Journal article that came out last week, about 40% are not responsive to PPIs. Uh, then study them and find out how many are really refluxing. Again, in the study that we published last week in the New England Journal, there, there are only 20% of them were really refluxing. So I would take 80% of those patients off PPIs is the first thing I'd do. Uh, and then of the 20% who are, re are refluxing, th th then I would address, is there a structural uh, impairment to the Nissen fundoplication? And if there's a structural impairment, I'd recommend a redo operation. Um, and if there's no structural uh, impairment, which is pretty rare, um, th th then, you, then you've got a little bit of a head scratcher. Sure. And then I guess the last thing I wanted to ask you really uh, is about when you, we see that minimally invasive surgery has gone through this evolution during your career and is always changing and evolving, what do you see as sort of the next frontier in minimally invasive surgery? Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it, it's a good question. You know, I, I think that the um, the thing that, that uh, I've sort of advocated to SAGES and have done so for quite a number of years, um, and SAGES has done a great job with it, by the way, um, is to um, make sure 
that the institutions that train residents um, have uh, fellows who have been well trained uh, to become new faculty members to then train the residents uh, in, in, uh, to do laparoscopic surgery. I really enjoyed watching the um, transition of laparoscopic skills going from being a very focused specialty amongst a focused group of you know, specialists like yourself and myself to more uh, broadly available such that uh, the emergency general surgical service, largely trauma surgeons, are, are, are very capable in our institution of not only laparoscopic appendectomy, laparoscopic col cholecystectomy, but they're probably the best at getting stones out of the bile duct. They're very proficient at doing laparoscopic common bile duct exploration uh, because that's what they do. So I, I think that, that sort of, if you will, taking the laparoscopic training and generalizing it so that, so that the skill level uh, increases to the point where most surgeons can do most things laparoscopically. I think that's that's our that's our goal. I don't see it going away. I don't see it being replaced by robotics. Although I know there's some individuals who would like that to happen. I certainly think that if there is a a, a less expensive robotic platform, uh, it'd be very interesting to see what that does. Um, but I I, um, I don't think we're going to. Um, uh, I don't think that laparoscopy is a transition state to something better yet. Sure. I actually thought of one more thing I want to okay. ask if you'll indulge me. Yeah. So the, um, if you had, could give sort of one message or piece of advice to medical students or junior residents who on, are embarking on a career in this field, what would that be? Uh, practice, practice, practice. I, 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 you know, I, I tell you, I learned my skills uh, by teaching uh, courses in laparoscopic surgery. And then at the end of the course, we would go and work on the stomach and esophagus, doing anastomoses, doing uh, suturing activities, working on our suturing skills. And it's sort of like playing the piano. You don't get better at playing the piano by doing it occasionally. You do it in a, in a concerted fashion uh, every day for a period of time uh, until you're really good at it. So use the simulators, use the box, use whatever you have to do, and just continue to practice whenever you have free time between cases at night when you're on call and things aren't going on. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, it's been a pleasure for me. Thank you very much, Kyle. Thanks. Take care.